in the book of Isaiah. I'm going to tell you first about a real-life king in the nation of Israel when they were um, the people of Judah that Isaiah uses. He introduces him at the beginning of chapter 6. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, this is Isaiah's calling to become a prophet. But in his calling, he saw God. The scriptures say that, I mean, God is spirit, so you can't see God properly. He doesn't have a body, therefore you can't see him. In the same way, you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. You can't see God. So in the Old Testament and now, when people see God, they see some embodiment of God, some manifestation of God, some vision of God. And what we're going to look at this morning, the Gospel of John actually says that Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus. But he begins by saying the year that King Uzziah died, which in itself is unique because the prophets don't normally introduce themselves based on a death, but on a life. So all in the Old Testament, it'll be um, in the 15th year of so-and-so's reign, in the 42nd year of so-and-so's reign, in the first year of so-and-so's reign, but Isaiah marks his calling by a death. And I think this is why. Uzziah became a king when he was 16 years old, and God blessed him mightily. The chronicler, one of the chroniclers of Israel's history, um, thus the name First and Second Chronicles, just a history of Israel, mentions about him that as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. He had a tutor, Uzziah did, the Bible says, named Zechariah, who taught him the fear of God. So Uzziah is a young man, becomes king after his father had been captured in war with the northern kingdom threatening to overtake them. They put him forward. Hey, how about this little, how about this guy? This prince could be the king and he's 16. Imagine how overwhelmed he would be by all of the responsibility. But he is taught by Zechariah, not the prophet Zechariah, but a different one, in the ways of fearing God. And he did. And then God blessed him. As long as he sought God, God blessed him. So he recaptured territory that his father had lost. He built um, towers in the wilderness. He dug cisterns. That means he established dwelling places for people to live where they couldn't previously live. He grew the size of the army. He had 2,600 mighty men of valor that were commanders of his army. His standing army was more than 300,000 men. And contrary to what was common in the armies of Israel, the people in the army, it wasn't like a professional standing army the way that many countries have today that get outfitted by the government. They were just living their life, and when the king needed soldiers, it was like, grab your own gun, whichever one you have, get your knife, grab your tent, and let's go to war. He was so prosperous, he armed and clothed his own army. He built up the fortification around the city of Jerusalem, and he even put um, new technology on the towers around the walls. He made machines invented by skillful men, 26.15 says, to be on the towers and the corners, to shoot arrows and great stones, and his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. This isn't hard to relate with, because many of you had this kind of life experience. In a season of desperation and feeling overwhelmed and anxious, you pour your heart out to God, and you're like, God, help me, I'll do anything. God does that thing, and then river cross, bridge forgotten, right? How, how, especially those of you who are older, you can look back on seasons of your life and see a great need, and you were fervent in prayer and faithful to obey because you needed something from God. And then God gives you that thing a child, a spouse, a new job, a new home, whatever the case may be, you know how this works. We have such a difficult time receiving the hand of God and still wanting his face. The, the fallen condition is brutal in this way. It's like when God gives us good things, it actually sometimes has the effect of wanting him less. Well, this is what happened to King Uzziah. He grew strong and he grew proud. And then in an expression of his pride, He demanded to go into the temple 
and he wanted to take the job that only the priest could do. He became so full of himself, completely forsaking the way of fearing God, who is holy and high, and then began to have an attitude that he can flippantly and casually approach God however he wants in whatever manner. So he goes into the temple, the head priest and 80 other priests presumably block his way in the temple and they correct him. What are you doing? This is not the place for you. It is not right for you to try to offer to God what only the consecrated priests and the descendants of Aaron can offer. And they rebuke him and they correct him. And he is so proud. He's in a place he ought not to be, trying to do something that he shouldn't be doing. And he has in his hand a censer to offer the incense. And when he gets corrected, the chronicler tells us, when he gets corrected by the priests, he's angry. You know what this is like. If you have ever been defensive, you know what this is like. Someone has the audacity to correct you, to point out your error, to ask you a question. I have that problem significantly, and I'm not the only one. How do you respond when others correct you for your sin, for your error? He's way in the wrong the priest pointed out to him and he's in the temple holding what he shouldn't hold and he has the arrogance to get angry. And then at that moment, God expresses some of his judgment on him and he causes his forehead to break out in leprosy. He's not the first to see it. The priests do. I'm like, whoa! And they go to, and then he sees it and they scurry him out of the temple and he flees from the temple. And he spends the rest of his life as king, separated from the people of God and the presence of God. No more can he go into the temple. So Uzziah reigned 52 years. He was one of the last great kings of God's people because he desired to know God. He was trained in fearing God, and for a time he did. And then his heart grew proud. And then God pushed him away. What happened to Uzziah is what's happening in the book of Isaiah to God's people. The beginning of Isaiah, the first five chapters, paint a very gloomy picture. You have received all this from God, and yet you push him away. So chapter five, if you were here last week, it uses a picture of a vineyard. And God essentially says to his people, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have given to my people? I formed them as a people, I've protected them, I've provided for them, I've given them a land, I've given them kings, I've given them everything they could ever need, and yet they refuse me. That's not hard to relate to, is it? Uzziah did the same thing. And so now, Uzziah, who experiences in leprosy a beginning of God's judgment, now he's dying. God's judgment is now full on Uzziah, and he dies. This is where Isaiah shares how he saw God. Read with me in Isaiah chapter 6. This is the word of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, 
lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. This is the word of the Lord. Isaiah is the opposite of Uzziah. In his rightful sight of God and in his rightful response. In chapter 6, Isaiah is the first to receive God's grace. He is the first one who sees God rightly and receives God's provision of a sacrifice made on his behalf. It's a complete foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Isaiah is the first to receive this grace. The nation of Israel rightly deserves God's judgment. Chapter 5 asks the question, how long will God's patience endure with his people? They refuse him, though he does everything. Isaiah is the first to receive grace. Then later, Isaiah will go on to compel the people of Israel that all who would respond to God would receive this grace. And then it gets even bigger. All in the world who would receive this provision, this sacrifice, will know God's grace. But first, it's Isaiah on the backdrop of what God's people deserve in light of God's holiness. He sees the glory of Jesus and he receives provision for his sin. So that what he says is woe, Jesus would then say is blessed. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. This morning, the word of Isaiah confronts us again with a unique view in Scripture of the holiness of God and models for us what the right posture is to know that grace and to receive it on your behalf. Because not everybody, not everybody who is confronted with the holiness of God says, woe is me, I am a sinner, I am undone. Most people confronted with far less than the holiness of God do as Uzziah did and get angry and offended when the word of God or the people of God or the spirit of God or their own conscience testifies to them about their own lack of holiness. So Isaiah for us is an example, and more than his example, I hope this morning, to just help you see God as he has revealed himself. So that if in your heart is a desire to know God, you will respond with, woe is me, woe upon me, and be freshly reminded of your need to receive what only God provides. And then if you will receive it, well then, blessed are you. What was originally woe to Isaiah becomes a blessing to all who will do as he did. Let's go through the chapter together. We'll look at the first seven verses this morning. In the year that King Uzziah died, just notice initially it's King Uzziah, but then what does Isaiah see down in verse five? He says, he has seen the king. He has seen the real king not the one who is unfaithful and who is now dead. He has seen the real one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Now, Isaiah really saw this, but remember, God doesn't have a body. So all of this is meant to have an effect upon us. I think Isaiah wants us to have this same vision of God and be reminded confronted, maybe educated for the first time about just how different from us God is. So the image starts with the Lord, the ruler, the sovereign one, is seated. 
seated. He's not threatened. He's at rest. He's seated where? On a throne. Kings sit on thrones. Royalty sit on thrones. He's sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, meaning he is the one that is praiseworthy. Jesus would say, hallowed is the name of God. Revered is the name of God. That's how Isaiah sees him. Completely higher, completely worthy, supremely valuable, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. The the hem of his garment The hem of his robe fills the temple. The temple is where the presence of God and people meet. It's the overlap between the world of the heavens, God's dwelling, and the world of the earth where people dwell. One day they will become one again. One day they were in the Garden of Eden. One day they will be again. But for this long stretch of history that Isaiah is part of, and so are we, the presence of God is in heaven. We are on earth. The temple is the one place in all the world where those intersected and overlapped. And the train of his robe fills it. Picture now a royal wedding from a bygone day. How big is the train of the bride's dress? You have a picture in mind of like this train like 20, 30 feet back down the aisle? Or you've seen this in pictures. Maybe even some of your, your parents had... Uh, Some of your moms or grandmas may have had a wedding dress like this. You've seen like a family photo where the wedding dress is like fanned out behind there. It's like you can't even step on that thing. It's an enormous mound. This is the image that God and his royalty and his regency is at a place where people can see him and he fills. This is the first time of three times in this little section that the imagery of filling or fullness is presented. The train of his robe fills the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. These are angelic beings. This is the only place in the Bible they're mentioned. And look how they're described. Each has six wings. With two he covered his face. The ESV, the English Standard Version that we use, is a very literal translation. So sometimes the language isn't as clear to follow as it could be. The, the singular language of he refers to each individual angel. So they're all doing this. All of these angels look this way. All of these angels are calling back and forth to each other. So each of these angels has six wings. With two they cover their face, two they cover their feet, two they fly. With two they cover their eyes. I think it's because even they, as angelic beings without sin, do not dare look upon the fullness of God's glory. Some of you remember in the Old Testament, after Moses came down from the mountain, after Moses saw a version of God, Moses had to cover his face because it was radiant. Moses at the burning bush. You know the story of the burning bush when God revealed himself in fire on a bush. Moses sees it. God calls to him from the bush. Once Moses knows that the bush is The presence of God has descended and has now revealed himself to Moses. Moses will not look at the bush. Exodus says, Moses wrote, he was afraid to look on the presence of God. I think they're covering their eyes out of the sheer holiness, the radiance of the glory of God. They cover their eyes. With two wings, they cover their feet. I'm not as certain why they cover their feet. There's something about feet and holy ground, where when you're on holy ground, you take your shoes off. I think more significantly is feet are often associated in scripture with the path that you will walk, the way that you will go. And I think this is actually a picture of angelic beings not living by their own will, but living by God's. They will only do and say what God has them do and say. God's will, not theirs. So their feet are covered. And with two wings, they fly. Incessantly, they fly. I think it's a picture of readiness. They are eager and attentive to do whatever God says. Wherever God would have them go, that's where they're going to go. They will say what God says. Their ears aren't covered, only their eyes. They will hear the instruction and the will of God, and they will do it. And what they do when they're not on assignment elsewhere, or perhaps this is the unique privilege of these angels, to be in the presence of God, they worship him. 
one calls to another. Verse 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, if you've been in a good church for any length of time, this phrase is very familiar to you, maybe even comforting to you. And as it should be, holy, holy, holy. Like, God, God is completely unaffected in his holiness and in his glory by anything on the world of men. Like, can we just recollect for a minute how quickly we can become anxious, overwhelmed, completely undone, even though we know better. If you're in Christ, you know full well the end of your physical life is just a gateway into a better, fuller, richer life than you have ever experienced, and yet you're afraid to die. The minute the doctor says, mm, these results aren't very clear, we're going to have to do more tests, you get a pit in your stomach. The minute you find out about someone's diagnosis, even when they're a believer, you like sound the call and the initial response is, we should pray for a miracle. Because, we, but we know. We know that the Spirit lives in us, and yet we can feel so alone. Like, do you recognize that the things that often put us on tilt, God is completely undeterred by? That's an encouragement if you're experiencing some kind of crisis or trial in your life that is making you anxious or afraid. Have a vision of God seated on his throne. He's not anxious. He's not afraid. He is the king. He is the sovereign one. All is well. He will sort everything out and you can trust him. So holy, holy, holy is familiar to us. It's encouraging to us. Do you know that this is completely unique? in all of scripture. In the Hebrew language, the way that they draw attention to the quality of something, they just say the same word twice. So in Kings, there's a description of gold, but they want to emphasize like the purity of this gold. So we would say, if we want to describe the purity of gold, what would we say? We would say pure gold. In Hebrew, they just say the word twice. Gold, gold. Look at this gold, gold, gold. Like, okay. So sometimes it's used as, super, as a superlative to heighten the intensity of something. We don't do that in English. We say something was very good. Something was um, super exciting, right? You know how that works in English. Hebrew, they just repeat the word twice. So sometimes it's as a superlative, but sometimes it's to picture the totality of something or the fullness of something. So there's a place in Genesis. They come to a new land and there's tar pits, tar pits everywhere. We would say, wow, you should have seen it. It was full of tar pits. There were tar pits everywhere. If you were a Hebrew speaker, you would say, you guys wouldn't believe it. Pits, pits. And all the English speakers are like, what? Pits, pits, you should have been to this place. There were pits, pits. What? Do you mean there were pits coming out of the pits? Yes, that's what I said. Pits, pits. Okay, so unique in the Hebrew Bible. This is the only time ever anything is described with a threefold repetition. Holy, holy, holy. When John has a vision of God, in the book of Revelation, he records the angel saying the same thing, holy, holy, holy. God is the quality of holiness. I think it's a summary term. Like, as an aside, very quickly, God's characteristics, his qualities, or his perfections, those are all synonyms. God's character, he's always all of those things. So God isn't a little bit merciful. God is always mercy. God isn't sometimes more just and sometimes less. It's not like a soundboard with all kinds of knobs that are God's characteristics. And like someone behind the scenes, like in the movie Inside Out, is like dialing up the characteristics. Oh, God's getting angry. Dial up the anger. That doesn't work like that. God is always all of his characteristics, all of his perfections. Holiness, I think, is the word, the way that we can have a handle to carry around in our mind the character of God. 
I think it's the word that describes all of the characteristics. He is completely unlike us. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the Lord, Yahweh of hosts. That's why I think there's lots of angels here. Hosts is an army. He is Yahweh, the I am of the hosts of heaven. The whole earth is full of his glory, not just the temple, not just the place where God dwells. To this day, whether you recognize it or not, the earth that you live in is full of the glory of God. So the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The day pours out speech, the night pours out speech, but there actually aren't audible words. Somehow without audible words, a message goes out. That Paul says in Romans 1, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature are clearly seen. The earth is full of God's glory. Look around this room. There are people made in the image of God whose body is more intricate and more well-designed than our technology can even scratch the surface of. We are just beginning to learn the tiniest little bit about how brains work and how many thousands of years have humans walked the earth. The earth is full of God's glory, and yet do you live with a mindfulness and an awareness of it? How kind of God to give us glimpses and visions of who he is. To see in Isaiah's word who God is. Because it is so easy for us to fill our eyes and our minds and our hearts with the lesser things around us that even though they're meant to point us to God's glory and beauty and provision and presence, they tend not to. The earth is full of of his glory. So this is what Isaiah sees. Now what he describes, I think it's important to understand, what Isaiah sees and what begins to happen renders him unable to be in the presence of God. The foundations of the thresholds shook as the angels called. The earth often trembles at the presence of God. Mount Sinai trembled at the presence of God. Here the angels call, even announcing the presence of God in his presence causes the threshold. That's the door jam, the door frame to shake. The door, he can't get in the door because it's shaking. And then now what's the next thing that happens? The house is filled with smoke. It's the third time in these verses filled is used. The house is filled with smoke. Okay, how well can you see in a room filled with smoke? You can't, exactly. So his presence from God, he can't get closer. He can't come into God's presence. And look at how he responds in verse 5. Woe is me. This is the prophet Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. This is the only way that you can be in the presence of God and live, is to acknowledge your unworthiness, the path to life. This is true today. The path to life is first recognizing that you are worthy of death, that you are not it's not like you're walking the road of life and come to find, oh, I don't deserve this. I should actually die. No, you're walking away from God, the road to death. You deserve death. You deserve separation from your sin. That's what we deserve. When you think of what you deserve from God, what comes to mind? What do you think the average American, when asked, if God exists, what do you think you deserve from him? What do you think the average American would say? I'm guessing there are very few who would say death. The one who answers the question death, I would run to that person and say, there is good news for you. You're absolutely right. But let me show you what God has done for you. And my guess is that person is highly likely to believe it and to receive it. Isaiah responds rightly, woe is me. Now, 
if you like to draw things in your Bible, circle woe, because it's the seventh instance of it. The fifth chapter that is bringing the picture of gloom to the forefront, Isaiah announces six woes. This is the seventh. It's a picture of completeness. Isaiah realizes the sin of God's people is not just their sin. You know how sometimes you hear a good teaching on the radio or at church or you read something good and you're like, oh, so-and-so needs to hear this. Like, truth be told, how many husbands sometimes hear a teaching and you're like, oh man, if my wife could just, can she not hear that she doesn't have to be afraid? She doesn't have to be anxious. And women sometimes married to men hear a teaching like, oh, if my husband could just hear this. If he could just... Look about humility. Why can he not hear that? In listening to me and the kids. Like, you know how we have a tendency to hear something and think somebody else needs this? Somebody's problem is worse than mine. Isaiah sees the holiness of God and he knows the problem is him. The woe is his. The final woe, it lands in him. He's lost. He's a man of unclean lips. The angels are praising God. Isaiah can't do it in that way. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. I think Isaiah is just rightly undone in the presence of God. And he can't get closer. I'm lost. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. Okay, so in the book of Isaiah, the people are shown to be unfaithful to God who is holy and righteous and just. And God gives them chance after chance and they won't respond. So God says, you judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I give them? And then the king, who was a symbol of God's blessing and provision when he responded faithfully to God, that king gets struck with leprosy for pushing God away. And then now that king dies. And then now the prophet is saying, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. I am a sinner. I am defiled. And now he sees the holiness of God? What should happen to Isaiah? Well, he should just like King Uzziah. He should get the fullness of God's justice in the presence of a holy God. And yet, something remarkably different happens. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, commanded by God. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. This is the altar in the temple of sacrifice. The priests were told at the institution of the temple to never let that fire go out. The fire is a symbol of God's holiness of God's presence. You often think of New Testament imagery that is more common today that fire is a purging element. So we're refined by fire. Peter uses that image. That's not in the Old Testament. Fire is a symbol of God's presence. So the burning bush is burning because God's presence is there. Mount Sinai is on fire when God descends on it. The altar is burning with the fire of God's justice and his holiness, and the angel takes from it a coal with a tong. So now the symbol of God's holiness, start making connections. This all points to Jesus. The angel takes the symbol of God's holiness, and he brings it to Isaiah, and he brings it right to him. The holiness of of God is brought to a man who knows he is a sinner. And then what does the angel say to him? Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. How is it that the symbol of God's holiness is now bringing to one life instead of bringing to one death. I think this is why 
the followers of Jesus why the Gospel of John says that Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke of him. I think this whole interaction, I think Jesus is the one, I think, pictured on the throne. That's what John says. But I think the coal, this also symbolizes Jesus. Because the altar is where sacrifice was made. Okay, picture this with me now. Let's build a fire. Okay, logs, depending on how good you are at building a fire, maybe you got kindling and something dry and a match. Or if you're like super all-star, you just got your strike and a flint. I'm not that manly. I am looking for the lighter or the lighter fluid. Okay, we got logs. We built ourselves a fire. Okay, if we're going to cook something on this, what do we have to do? We've got to let it burn for a while and get nice and hot. And then a sacrifice is made on it and the animal is consumed. The sacrifice is offered. And then as the fire continues to burn, we're left with coals. So after the fire has consumed the sacrifice, the coal that has been satisfied, the flame of the holiness of God that is now satisfied by the sacrifice is taken and applied to Isaiah. This is a picture of Jesus. Jesus who is the holiness of God. Jesus who is the sacrifice of God. So that all who would in the presence of God say, I am a sinner. I am undone. I do not deserve life from God, but I deserve death. I am not what I should be in thought, in word, or in deed. I am not holy. If that's who God is, then I cannot be in his presence. The one with that attitude who receives the satisfaction of God through the sacrifice that he has made, that one can know the presence of God. So for someone who isn't a believer, this is a picture of God's holiness, but it's an invitation to, like Isaiah, not like King Uzziah, whose heart grew proud, like Isaiah, to say, woe is me. That one, receiving the sacrifice of Jesus on their behalf, then the woe of my sin, the woe of my death, the woe of what I deserve, becomes the blessing that Jesus spoke of. For those of you, the majority of you, who are already followers of Jesus, I would compel you to consider the holiness of your God and remember what His holiness is means that he is completely different than you. We can only celebrate his presence, even have confidence in his presence because of what Jesus has done. So when others, God, God's word, God's people, his spirit in you, your own conscience, when they convict you of the pride of your heart, the sin in your life, you don't be like Uzziah who gets angry about it as though God is treating you unjustly be reminded that God is holy and respond like Isaiah. Woe is me. This is not right. This is sin. God, I am sorry. Will you forgive me? And receive again the finished work of Jesus on your behalf that once then his justice and his holiness are satisfied by the sacrifice of Jesus. Well then purity and wholeness are yours again. Let me pray for us.